In this lecture in 209, we're going to continue our discussion of point estimators with the maximum likelihood estimation. So the method of maximum likelihood was first introduced by Fisher. He's a geneticist and a statistician that was from the 20s. He's quite famous in statistics. Um, again, here is his bio. Um, in 1913, this is a photograph or a portrait of him. And again, he's from England and worked all the way up until basically until he died in 1960. And he's just known for a lot of contributions in statistics, basically the entire uh, undergraduate curriculum, everything that you would ever encounter basically is attributed to him. Most statisticians recommend this method of maximum likelihood estimation when the sample size is large since the resulting estimators have certain desirable um, properties and we'll talk a little bit more about that so let's talk about our definition that we have so we have a random variables x1 x2 all the way up to xn they have a joint probability mass function or probability density function so here you have f of x1 x2 all the way up to xn so those are kind of the realizations of the random variables and over here are your parameters now they're unknown when you have x1 all the way up to xn are the observed sample values or those are the realizations and you have this function is regarded then as a function of theta 1 all the way up to theta m so you could have m parameters for the distribution we call this the likelihood function so again right here that is what we would call the likelihood the maximum likelihood estimates or the MLEs so we have our little estimates of our parameters that are unknown to us are those values of the theta that maximize the likelihood function so that if you plug in your estimators into this function it is the best that it can be um, it maximizes it for any of those thetas that you pass into it and when all those xi's are substituted in place of xi's like so you have the random variable and here is your realization or your observed values the maximum likelihood estimators result the likelihood function tells us how likely the observed sample is a function of the possible parameter values and maximizing the likelihood gives the parameter values for which the observed sample is most likely to have been generated that is the parameter values that agree most closely with the observed data so like I was saying before um, these MLEs have nice properties that we like so in when we have large samples like a large number of samples the we, we end up getting a, a nice property so although the principle of maximum likelihood estimation has considerable intuitive appeal the following proposition provides additional rationale for the use of maximum likelihood estimators so over here under very general conditions on the joint distribution of the sample when the sample size n is large the maximum likelihood estimator of any parameter theta is approximately unbiased and has variance that is nearly as small as can be achieved by any estimator so this is what is very useful to us when the sample size is large then the maximum likelihood estimator is approximately unbiased because of the result and the fact that calculus based techniques can be used to derive the maximum likelihood estimators maximum likelihood estimation is the most widely used estimation technique among statisticians many of the estimators used in the remainder of the book are MLEs 
and obtaining an MLE, however, does require that the underlying distribution be specified. So we have to assume that there's some underlying distribution in order to uh, create our maximum likelihood estimators. So we'll start off with our first example. So we'll start off with the Bernoulli distribution. So we have this over here. So we have a Bernoulli distribution. Suppose that we have n rounds for target practice, and each shot is independent. For each round, we assume that we will either hit the target with probability p or miss with probability 1 minus p. So to model this, we have x1, x2, all the way up to xn. So this is a random variable for each of our shots or our rounds that we're going to fire. There's n of them. And each of those can either be a 0 or 1. So we can either say it was a success, which means that we hit our target, so it's 1 or 0, and so on for each of these random variables. We need to find the maximum likelihood estimator of p. So let's do our solution. So the probability mass function for each of these random variables, um, with a estimator p, Well, we can write out our let's use F. So this is our likelihood function. So again, you can have the probability of success that happens Xi and over here it's one minus P. 1 minus xi. That's if xi is equal to 0 or 1. So again, it's either 0 or 1. So that's what we're going to pass in. Otherwise, we'll set this equal to 0. So, and that's also where we have um, P has to be between 0 and 1. Then we're going to create our likelihood function. So in this case, Our likelihood function is we have x1, x2, all the way up to xn, and we have our parameter, our estimator that we're going to do for it, so p hat, and that's equal to, well, it's the function of x1 for p hat multiplied by the function x2 of p hat all the way up to xn of p hat. So the other way that we can write that is by expressing it as a product. So we use pi or p for product. And that's going from i equals 1 to n. And that's of fxi p hat. So that's one way, with another way that we can express it instead of having to write all that out. So I can write this out. So we'll substitute in our x1 for this. So we have p hat x1 
multiply by 1 minus p hat, and it'll be 1 minus x1. And then we do it for x2, so this is the p hat x2, 1 minus p hat, 1 minus x2. And that continues all the way up to we get to the xn. So in that case, that's p hat xn, 1 minus p hat, and then 1 minus xn. So we can simplify um, these exponents here. So um, when I have these, they're all multiplying to each other, I just have to add the exponents then. So I have x1, x2, all the way up to xn. So I'm going to use a summation. So p hat, and we're going to sum all those xi's. The next one that we have is uh, 1 minus p hat. And again, you're going to have n, well, you're going to have 1 and 1 and 1. So that will be, that happens n times minus the summation of xi. So that's how we can express our likelihood function. Now, in order to implement the method of maximum likelihood, we need to find that p that maximizes that likelihood. And we need to put on our calculus hats now, since in order to maximize the function, we're going to need to differentiate this likelihood function with respect to our parameter p hat. So in doing so, we, we use a trick that often makes the differentiation a bit easier. So notice that the logarithm function is an increasing function of f, oh sorry, of, of x. So again, over here, I can write something like this. And um, let's go with the natural log. So something like this. I'll call this y equals ln of x. So it's an increasing function. So it's an increasing function. And that is what, what I mean is that if you have x1 is less than x2, then f of x1 is less than f of x2. So that means that the value of p that maximizes the natural logarithm of the likelihood function is also the value of p that maximizes the likelihood function. So the trick is to take the derivative. Um, what we can do is still apply this transformation, which again is still increasing. It doesn't change, but it allows us to um, apply a logarithm to this likelihood function, and it makes it easier for us to differentiate. And we'll see in a second that when I take the the natural logarithm so again well let's say we take the natural log of it What we end up getting is, okay, well, we have the logarithm of f. And what I can start to do is if I apply the logarithm here, we 
we can start to apply some of our logarithm rules that we have. So when I have two terms, in this case here, remembering our logarithm rules, if you have the ln of AB, this is equal to the ln of A plus the ln of B. So we can break this up. I can have ln of P hat, and then I have my summation, whoops. That should be my summation. Plus, we have the ln of 1 minus p hat to the n minus ln, uh, the summation of equals 1 to n of xi. Okay, so we've broken it up using this rule. Now the other rule that is useful is that if I have something like ln of x to the r, then I can actually bring down that exponent in front. So again, it just comes down in front. So what that means here is that I can have the exponent here come down in front of the logarithm. And we can do the same thing here. This exponent here can come down in front. So what I get is n minus the summation of i equals 1 to n of xi ln of 1 minus p hat. Now, we have this function that we've created now, we, the log likelihood. What we'd like to do now is to find that maximum value of p hat. So so what we're going to do is we're going to do what we do in calculus. We take the derivative and we'll set it to zero to find our critical points. So what we need to do is take the derivative. So we'll take the derivative of our function ln f with respect to the parameter that we're looking for. So in this case, it's p. And we set it to 0. So now we have to take the derivative of this. And we got to take it with respect to p. So Taking the derivative, what I get is um, I treat this like a constant because this, this has no p in it, so leave it alone. Derivative of ln p is just 1 over p then. And then for this part here, um, I leave that alone. So again, I have my n minus my summation. Then I take the derivative of this. So that's one over. 1 minus p hat. And then I got to take the derivative of the inside of the function. So 
there is a minus p, so the derivative of that is just minus 1. So instead of writing minus 1 here, I'll just put the minus sign right there. So we got to set this equal to 0. So then the next thing I'm going to do is I'll multiply through by um, let's multiply by p hat 1 minus p hat so when we do that well what I'll do is I'll write this all out so let's grab another pen let's put this here so if I multiply through What that happens is this goes away. Minus. So again, I'm going to have my p hat, 1 minus p hat here. Then I'll have my summation. And minus the sum of xi. 1 over 1 minus p hat. And again, multiplying through by p hat minus 1 p hat. Again, I, I could put it on the right hand side, but it's times 0, so that disappears. This goes away. So then. Continuing with this, what I end up having is one minus p hat, and we'll have our summation still minus and minus our sum. zero. Now what we can do is we can um, distribute this part right here so what we end up getting is we get a summation minus p hat Then we distribute this negative here, so we get a negative n plus the summation here. And oops, I need to also remember I got my p hat here. So I need to distribute that. So I got negative n p hat and I have p hat here as well. So what's nice now is I have the p hat times uh, my sum of my xi, so that cancels with the negative version of it. This is still equal to 0. Let's just write out what we have left. And now we can solve for uh, p hat. So again, we have a negative and a negative, so that becomes positive. I can bring that. Uh, n over to the right hand side, so that's 1 over n multiplied by the sum of xi. And that 
we know is to be x bar. So what we've shown is that our estimator, our maximum likelihood estimator, is just the sample mean. Excellent. And so that's the end of our first example. So what we should do is let's recap what I did. What I did was we suppose that we have a random sample. So we have x1 all the way up to xn are random variables that are independent and identically distributed. So they're coming from the same distribution with an unknown parameter, theta. To find the MLE, or the maximum likelihood estimator, theta hat, we do the following. We set up that likelihood function. So again, it's the joint probability mass or density function. So of x1, x2, all the way up to xn. Well, all we do is we multiply each of the individual PMF or PDFs. Then we apply the natural logarithm to the likelihood function so that we have the ln of f is equal to ln of, so now we have a product of the PMFs, the individual PMFs, is equal to the sum of the ln of f. Then we take the derivative of it with respect to our, un, our parameter estimator and we set that to zero. Then we solve for theta. Now, going back, what we should verify is that we did indeed obtain a maximum. So again, And we can do that by um, we can do that by taking the second derivative. Right, that's our second derivative test. And we need to make sure that it is negative. So now that we have our kind of our recipe that we're going to do, we can do this uh, with lots of different distributions. So the idea is that if we know what or we have an idea of what the underlying distribution is, we can create an estimator based on the observations so that we could put that into our probability distribution. Let's do an example. So let's do this with the exponential function. So doing this with the exponential distribution, so again, we have 
no, we have to have a random sample. And it's coming from the um, exponential distribution. And again, that will have um, some parameter. We have an unknown parameter, which is, um, let's go with lambda. So the likelihood function then is, um, let's go with, so again, it's got to be of our supposed observed samples. So we have x1, x2, so these are little x's, all the way up to xn. And we're going to have our parameter that we're going to try to estimate, which is lambda. So we'll give it a little hat. And we are going to be multiplying each of those probability densities. So we have f of xi. There's our lambda. So plugging that in. Our exponential distribution is lambda e to the minus lambda xi. Again, you could expand that out by saying lambda e to the minus lambda x1 times lambda e to the minus lambda x2 all the way up to dot 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 up to xn. At that point we can start to factor so or basically I'm going to group terms so I have lambda happens 1 2 all the way up to n so that's lambda to the n we have e to the minus, so we can sum up all these exponents. So I have lambda, I'm going to sum up to xi. Then let's take the natural logarithm. So what we have is we have ln of f all the way up to lambda, oh sorry, no, up to n, and then we have our lambda. Again, we're going to have ln of what we have over here, so lambda n e to the minus lambda, the summation xi. So again, we can break these apart. So again, these are being multiplied. So I can have lambda, sorry, ln of lambda n plus ln of e to the minus lambda summation of xi. Again, these can come down in front. So by doing that, I get n times ln of lambda. I have a minus, so minus lambda times the summation. And then we have ln e. So hopefully you recall that ln of e is 1. So have ln, uh, sorry, n ln lambda minus lambda multiplied by the sum of xi. So now we need to take the derivative.
So again, we're estimating lambda. So I'm just going to add some little hats because again, these are that's our estimator. So in order to do that, what we need to do is take the derivative of ln of f with respect to lambda. So that means, again, taking the derivative of this with respect to lambda, that leaves me with just n uh, because that's like a my constant. And then I have ln of lambda. So that is n over lambda. And then the, this term here that I need to take the derivative is just, well, I have lambda. So that just goes, that's just one. And then I'm just left with the quote unquote constant. This is my summation. So I just have the sum from 1 to n of xi, and that's it. That's all I have for my derivative. I've set it equal to 0 because I want to find my critical value. And uh, so now what we need to do at this point solve for our parameter so i'll bring this over to the right hand side so this becomes positive i'm left with n over lambda so right here then I have uh, 1 over lambda I'll bring that n over to the right hand side that goes into the denominator so right here we know that this is x bar so what I've got is 1 over lambda is equal to x bar or you know flipping it around lambda is equal to 1 over x bar. And that is our maximum likelihood estimator of lambda for the exponential distribution. Okay, so let's talk about the Poisson distribution then. This over here. And in this one, we're going to consider the Poisson distribution. in two in two dimensions okay so the Poisson distribution can be used to model lots of things we talked about this before but let's can be used to model the number of events that occur in a two-dimensional region if we assume that when the region R is being sampled has an area we'll call AR, so that's the area that corresponds to the region. The number of events X occurring in region R has a Poisson distribution with parameter lambda times the area. Again, where lambda is the expected number of events per unit area, and that non-overlapping regions yield independent random variables Xi. So, Suppose an analyst partitions a region R into 
n non-overlapping regions, say r1, r2, all the way up to um, rn, and counts the number of bomb hits found within a region. The joint probability mass function, the likelihood is then, well, we should take a moment that um, we could, ex for example, look at something like this. So during the flying bomb attack on London during World War II, there was frequent assertions that were made that the points of impact of the bombs tended to be grouped in clusters. So again, you can kind of see a cluster here and maybe a cluster there, clusters. What a statistician at the time by the name of Clark, 1946, he analyzed the problem and found that the Poisson distribution did a really good job at modeling how the bomb hits were distributed over South London. So that's what we're going to try to do. Um, what he then took is he kind of takes this and he breaks them up into smaller and smaller non-overlapping regions. So the idea behind that is we break it up and we have a whole bunch of squares. You count how many hits there are within the square. And what he found was that it follows a Poisson distribution. So let's just do that. So we have that the likelihood is given by x1 all the way up to xn for some lambda that we're going to try to estimate. So in this case, our parameter of our Poisson distribution is lambda times a r. So if you have it for a particular region, say r1, what that ends up being is that you have lambda a r1 to the x1 e to the minus lambda a r1 and we divide it by x1 factorial. And we do that all the way up to the nth, to the nth uh, sample. So we have lambda a r2, sorry, n, because we're going to the n here. So x n e to the minus lambda a r n. And again, that's divided by xn factorial. So we can start to group our terms. We have lambda here and here. This happens n times. But uh, we also have that uh, x1, x all the way up to xn. So we can do a summation of xi. And then we also have a r 1 to the x1 all the way up to a r n x to the n. Over here we have e to the minus lambda and we can just sum up our expon exponents so we have a r i and then we divided this all by x1 factorial, x2 factorial, all the way up to xn. Okay, then the next thing is we take the log of this
and what we get is again we have the lawn of p of x1 all the way up to xn again we have to add our little hats So again, you just take the logarithm of all of this. Okay, so again, you simplify, you break this all apart. What we end up doing is then, you know, there's a little bit of algebraic work that you'll need to do. What we then do is we need to take the derivative at that point. with respect to lambda and then set it again set it again set it to 0 what we end up getting is summation of xi all over lambda minus okay and then again solving for lambda what we end up getting is well we bring that over to the right hand side so again I can just kind of bring this over into the denominator and then I'm left with what I'm left with is lambda is equal to summation so again you have your count of how many times that you've seen something divided by the area so essentially you know you got your counts over your area. And intuitively, this seems reasonable since lambda is the true density, which is the bombs per unit area, whereas uh, the lambda hat is the sample density. And since this in the denominator is just the total area sampled, um, what we would expect also is that. Um, We would expect that in each of those squares, lambda a r i, the estimator is unbiased. So again, at the time of the flying bomb attack on South London, it's interesting to note that most people believed in a tendency of the points of impact to cluster so again something like that if this were true then there would be a higher frequency of areas with either many hits or not hits and a deficiency in the intermediate classes so 
what we can actually do is look at the number of hits. So what they did was they took this which was uh, they took an area of a hundred and forty four uh, square kilometers and what they then did was they broke that up They broke it up into 576 squares of quarter square kilometers each. So what I drew, you know, I'm, I drew a whole a grid in there. It's actually quite more finer. So, you know, comprise, comprising of 576 squares. And what they did then, when they broke it up into the little squares, then they sat there and then they counted each of the bomb hits inside of each square. And they made a count, and that's where they had a number of squares containing 0, 1, 2, etc. flying bombs. And over the period considered, the total number of bombs within this area involved was 537. So, we can actually, using the maximum likelihood estimator that we derived, we can find an estimate of lambda for the Poisson distribution to model the bomb spatial distribution. So again, for us, we have lambda hat, which is essentially the number of hits all over the total area. So like I said, there was 537 hits. And they broke that up into 576, let's call them regions, quarter square kilometers. And if you break out your calculator, um, you do 537 over 576. Uh, this is approximately equal to 0.9323. And this would be the number of bomb hits per quarter square kilometer. So, again, going back to our expectation of it, what they found was this. So, what we do is we construct a table. We have the number of hits in a square. Then we have our probability, 
And in this case, our lambda is 0.9323. So we can calculate that, plugging it into our Um, and I think this, yeah. So we should have lambda to the x, and that should be e to the minus lambda over x factorial. So we can calculate each of those probabilities. So the probability that there's zero hits in a square is 0 0.393. Um, the probability that you're in a quarter, a square kilo, uh, a quarter square kilometer, uh, that with one hit is around 36.7%. There's two hits in a quarter square kilometer. It's there's 17%. So, out of those, basically, this gives you a proportion of those 576 squares that you would have uh, the number of those squares would have that um, so out of the 576 you know 39 percent of those would have zero of them so that would mean approximately 226 of those uh, quarter square kilometer would have zero hits um, out of the 576, you know, 36 or 37 percent of them would have one hit. So again, there would be out of the 576, 36 percent of those or 37 percent of those would be 211.39. So again, those are our expected number of hits in a square. What the statistician Clark found is that it was remarkably close to the actual number of hits in the squares. So while we are calculating it at 226, the actual number of hits where there was zero was 229. That's really close. The same thing with 211 is almost exact. 98 to 93, 30 to 35, 7 to 7, and 1 to, uh, 1 1.5 or 1.6 to 1. Now, we should not lose sight of the real consequences of aerial bombing in the Second World War. In total, all sides, hundreds of thousands of civilians were killed. And as humans, we... Um, as humans, we see patterns. We want events to have some explanation or, or narratives. But the knowledge that who lived and who died was driven by random chance is often hard to hear and no matter how conclusive the statistical tests. So that's the end of that example. So we came up with a estimator to use in our Poisson distribution. What we can do next, that is also very common. So we've done it for one parameter. We've done it with the Bernoulli. Um, we did it with the Poisson distribution. We did it with the exponential. So what happens when we have two estimators, or sorry, when we have to estimate two parameters of a distribution? So if, when we have, like, say, the normal distribution, again, we have x1 all the way up to xn. The independent...
and they're all coming from the same normal distribution. So we have our mean and our variance. So we can do the same thing again, 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 just as a refresher. Finding our maximum likelihood estimator again. We set up our likelihood function, which is the product of the individual uh, probability mass function of our x, xi. Then we apply the natural logarithm, take the derivative of it with respect to our parameter, and set it to zero. Then we solve for theta. But now we're going to have two parameters that we need to estimate which means that I'm going to have a function ln of f that depends not only on to say mu but also on sigma squared. So that means when we take the derivative we need to do the partial derivatives with respect to the one parameter that we're estimating and we also have to do the derivative with respect to the other parameter we're trying to estimate. And then we have to solve for both of them. So that's our plan. So we have the likelihood function. So in this case, we have our two parameters that we're going to estimate. So we're going to estimate the mean and the variance. So again, it's the product of the individual mass density functions. So expanding that out, I could write that. You know, these. This is the shorthand way of writing it. Now we just have to remember what the normal distribution is. So. The density for that is 1 over the square root of 2 pi sigma squared. That's, and then multiply by e to the minus, we have x1 minus mu. This is squared all over 2 sigma squared. Dot, dot, dot. And so that will, you know, you'd write it for x2 all the way up to xn. Again, they all have little hats on the parameters that we're trying to estimate. So... What we have over here, you have 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma squared. And again, that would happen n times. So we'll put it to the n. Then we can group some of these together. So again, what's left over here is we have our exponential functions. So 
dot 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 all the way up to minus x minus n to the minus mu squared all over to sigma squared so uh, right here this is a square root so that's to the one half it's in the denominator so it's negative one half so I could express that as 2 pi sigma squared and that would be to the 1 over 2 negative one half and then we still have that n so we would put that here I get 2 pi sigma squared to the minus n over 2. Next we get e and then uh, I'm going to sum these because these are my exponents. Okay. So again, we take the log. What's nice about that then is by taking the log of this, what I get is the exponent comes down in front, so I get negative n over 2 ln of 2 pi sigma squared. Same thing, this comes down in front. So, again, there's a plus. So, um, in fact, though, Okay, so that comes down in front. We still have that minus, so that minus there. So I'm just going to put that right here now. And lastly, you have ln of e, which again, that's 1. Now we have to take the partial derivatives. And that's with respect to mu. And we also have to take it with respect to sigma squared. And then you set them to 0. Okay, so doing that, so let's do it for the first one. So we have the partial of ln of f with respect to mu, we're going to set that equal to 0. So taking the derivative of that, what we have is, well, there's no mu's here, so that's 0. Then what I'm left with is just what's inside here. So I need to take the, well, I have minus 1 over 2 sigma squared. So I don't have to worry about that. That's a constant. And then I need to take the derivative of the inside here. So in here, the derivative of this is, well, there's the minus mu. So I need to use chain rule. So the 2 comes down in front.
Then I need to take the derivative of the inside. So there's mu, so it becomes negative 1. It's equal to 0. So now I have a negative 1 and a negative out here. So again, those will become positive. We can multiply through by sigma squared and by doing so And uh, the, another thing that we can cancel out, I just noticed that, we can cancel out here and here. Perfect. So multiplying by uh, sigma squared, what we can then cancel out, let me grab another pen, so I can cancel out this and this. So what I'm left with is that summation of xi minus mu is equal to 0, which we can expand that out. So well, this is a constant, so a constant that's repeated n times, so it's n mu. And over here, we can just leave that alone. Now, we need to solve for one of our parameters. So in this case, we have mu. So we can bring that over to the left-hand side. Well, bring this over to the right-hand side. becomes positive, and then bring the n over to the right-hand side. Which we know is to be the sample mean. So therefore, our maximum likelihood estimator is x bar, or the sample mean. Now we're not done yet, because we've done it for mu, we need to do it for sigma squared. So, let me see if I can, I'll put it on the same sheet. So, We need to take the derivative with respect to sigma squared. So over here, we need to take this derivative because there's a derivative right there. So what I have is, um, I can treat that like a constant, so n over 2. And then I need to take the derivative of this, so it's 1 over everything inside there. times the derivative of the inside, and I treat the entire thing here, the sigma squared, as a variable. So um, so I just have a constant times the, the variable, so it's just the constant. Next, I have a, the variable is in the denominator. So What ends up happening is that in the denominator, it will go down a degree, so that becomes sigma squared squared. We have a negative that comes out. 
and we still have a summation in front, but we don't have to do anything with it. We can simplify now at this point. We can cancel out this 2 here. We can cancel out a pi. And what else can we cancel? Don't see anything else. So, what we have is just minus n over 2 sigma squared. Again, I still have that 2 there. Minus 1 over 2 sigma squared squared. Now, what we can do is multiply through by um, let's multiply by so I have something like this if I multiply everything by if I want to get rid of that denominator so multiply by 2 sigma squared squared What ends up happening is that this will go away, and I'm still left with, well, those, those twos cancel, and now I'm left with minus n. One of these sigma squareds gets canceled, so I'm just left with sigma squared up top. And those, I have a 2 cancel as well here, so that goes away. And I still have a minus here. So, Now we can start to solve for sigma squared, and in doing so, we bring this over to the right hand side. Oh, yeah, it should be a plus. So if I bring it over, now I have a minus and a minus that will change back to a plus. Dividing through by n, I get 1 over n. We're almost finished because I already know that mu hat is x bar. So I can replace that. So yeah, I better make sure I leave that minus. I don't know why. So 
what we should just make one little remark is that notice that the maximum likelihood estimator is not the sample variance. The denominator is over n instead of n minus 1. So this means that the MLE is biased. And that concludes our lecture on maximum likelihood estimators.